But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear. I grew up in a family where the narrative of God was an angry, wrathful, mean-spirited, and hateful God. And if you did anything wrong, that you would be condemned for life. Well, my wife, Amy, she lived out what it was like to be a follower of Jesus. She was forgiving, she was gentle, she was kind, and she spoke the truth. And that truth was she shared the gospel with me. And it was so clear to me that when she shared the gospel, that the narrative I had believed for all those many years about God was completely wrong. And I've had those seasons of doubt where I've not been able to understand something that's going on in my life. But what I found so helpful was I could give it to Jesus. Experiencing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and just knowing that God has a perfect plan for my life, that gives me confidence. And I've also seen Jesus move so powerfully all throughout my life through multiple circumstances, through many years of trials and struggles and suffering, but also in times when I was on combat deployments and separated from my family, experiencing his presence both there and now today, every day is just a day that I love to be able to walk on that journey with Jesus. The joy that I have being in his presence and the strength and the perseverance and the patience and the endurance that that gives me just gives me all the hope in the world. Amen. The presence of the risen Jesus Christ in our lives changes everything. So a few weeks ago, we gathered together online and on campus and we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We recognize that Jesus, God among us, Emmanuel, left the glory of heaven, came and lived a life with no sin, no wrong, perfectly God with us, and yet he was nailed to a cross. They crucified him. He took our sins. He took our shame. He took our punishment on himself. And after hours on that cross, he died. He breathed his last breath. A soldier took a, a spear and thrust it into his heart and the water and the blood came pouring out. He was dead. They put him in a tomb and there he lay for three days. And on the third day, the one who was dead was alive again. Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin and hell and death and the enemy. He rose in victory. And then, before he ascended to heaven, over a course of, of a number of weeks, he walked again on this earth. He kept popping up and showing up. He was the same Jesus, but he was in a, in a resurrection body. So he could move from one place to another. He could walk through walls. He, 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 was, he was a resurrected Jesus. And so, so in the garden, he appeared to two women who had come to remember him, who were mourning over his loss. And he appeared to them. And they were just amazed. And then he appeared to two men walking on a road on a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem after they thought, well, it's all over now. They're walking back home to Emmaus and Jesus appears to them. He walks with them. And then around the table, he breaks the bread and their eyes are open. They recognize him and he disappears. And so those two men hurry back to Jerusalem. They got to tell me, there's no other way to communicate but walking, getting there and telling someone. So they go back and, and they're in a room and they're, and they're talking to some of the other disciples. And we're all there in this room. The doors are locked because they're afraid because they thought the people who killed Jesus were going to come after them too. So the doors are locked, and all of a sudden, Jesus is right there with them. And they're startled. Of course they're startled. And he says, peace be with you. And we, and we looked at how Jesus revealed himself to them. He said, if you need to touch my hands, touch them. If you need to see the holes in my feet, you can see them. It's me. I've risen again. And person after person after person, Jesus appeared to. But when Jesus appeared in that room with all those disciples, there was one person who was missing. There was one person who wasn't there. And that was Thomas. Thomas. So when they, when they told Thomas that Jesus had risen, they, that now he wasn't there anymore, but now they said, but well, you saw him. Thomas said, I, I need to touch his hands and see his feet. I need to experience what you experienced. And from that day on, we've given Thomas a nickname. Anybody know what that nickname is? Doubting Thomas. But I think we gotta lighten up on Thomas a little bit because we all doubt. Before we come to faith in Jesus, there's doubts we struggle with. And even after we put our faith in Jesus, 
we don't have everything figured out. I've been a pastor for almost 40 years. I wish I could tell you every question has been answered. All the struggles and challenges are gone. They're all wrapped up in a little package, a little bow there, and boom, never another doubt. But I'll tell you, even as a pastor, there's times, and you may have experienced it too, where there's deep loss or struggle, or why did that happen? And we have those flickers and thoughts of, what's going on here? And what we're going to learn about Jesus is that he understands your doubts. He understands my doubts. He understands that we struggle with things. And he's so patient to walk with us through those things, whether we've come to the cross and received Jesus, but sometimes we, we, we doubt and wonder, is he really with me? Is he really protecting me? And look what happened. How can, is he really watching over me? But sometimes we struggle. He's patient with us. And if you're, if you're not yet a Christian, you, you're kind of investigating Jesus, and maybe you're here because there was a baptism today, or maybe you're online and a friend invited you to watch the service, wherever you are. If you say, well, I'm not a Christian yet, but I'm trying to figure it all out, but there's things I'm wondering about. There's questions I have. Sometimes I have doubts about stuff. That's maybe why I'm stepping back from really putting my life in Jesus' hands. If that's you, understand something. Jesus is so patient with you. He's not offended by your questions. He's not bothered by your doubts. He wants to walk with you and let you know that even once you put your faith in him, there's still gonna be moments where you struggle, and that's okay. Our message today is called No Doubt But Fresh Faith. And what I want to do today is I just want to tell you two stories. I want to tell you an ancient story, and I want to tell you a modern story. I want to tell you the story about Thomas. We're going to walk through John chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 20. If you have your Bible app, you can go there. We'll have it on the screens also online and on campus. But, but John chapter 20, we're going to, we're going to look at this. But, but, but really, we're, we're going to tell two stories today. One is the story of Thomas, an ancient story about somebody who struggled with doubts but had his faith restored. And then we're going to look at a modern story. A story about a woman named Allie, Allison, who happens to be my oldest sister. I grew up in a family of five kids, and uh, all of us were raised in the same home, a home that was, I would call it atheistic or agnostic. My parents would have said, we don't think there's a God. You can't know if there's a God. There might be, but we're really not sure. We weren't raised in faith. We weren't raised and taught how to follow Jesus. And so uh, my sister Allison watched her younger sister Gretchen become a Christian, and then her brother Kevin, me, become a Christian. And then her younger, younger, younger sister Lisa become a Christian. Then her younger brother Jason become a Christian. And she was still keeping Jesus at arm's length. Not there yet. So she's kind of watching her siblings raised in the same atheistic home, one by one by one become Christians. Three of them go into different kinds of ministry and kind of going, but I'm not there yet. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're somebody who says, I'm, I'm at church, I'm checking it out, I, I actually like to come, there's nice people, good, good continental breakfast and nice donuts and good music and, and hopefully some nice talks, and this. I, I like it, but I'm not, I've not embraced Jesus yet. If that's you, I hope you just open your heart today to see what God has to say to you. As we hear this, the story of Thomas, an ancient story, and the story of my older sister, Allison, Allie, a modern story. And so, so I want to say also, when we think about Thomas and Thomas's journey, Thomas, in, you know, in one moment... You know, he says to these people, the disciples who'd seen Jesus, he says, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready to embrace what you've experienced till I experience it. And we've called him doubting. You, you can get a nickname and it lasts the rest of your life. And for Thomas, Thomas, it's not just lasted the rest of his life, it's lasted for 2,000 years. But let's be honest. Okay? If we're really honest and really truthful, all of us have moments where we struggle with questions and doubts. And if you're a Christian... The enemy will whisper in your ear, if you have a doubt, you're not a Christian. If you have a doubt, you probably don't believe in Jesus. That's a lie. That's a lie. If you've given your heart to Jesus, you love him, you believe in him, and then something really painful happens and you say, God, where are you? God, I'm struggling. God, I feel so lonely. Or God, I'm wondering. That's okay. Draw near to Jesus in those moments. Don't turn away. And if you're not yet a Christian and you're saying, I'm trying to figure out who Jesus is, but I got some questions. I got some doubts about this whole thing. That's okay. Not only is Jesus' arms open, but here at Shoreline, We'll walk with you, we'll talk with you. We got groups of people that meet together that have questions who aren't Christians and say, I just have questions I want to ask and figure out the Jesus thing. That's fine. We welcome that because Jesus welcomed. And you're going to see in this passage how Jesus didn't push people away when they doubted, but he invited them in and wanted to meet them right where they were at. So, so the disciples are meeting, they encounter Jesus, Thomas isn't there. And I call this the ultimate you should have been there moment. Have you ever one of those you should have been there? Anybody here who's, who's a surfer? You know you show up to go surfing, right? And he goes, oh, dude, you should have been here like two hours ago. You're not here. It's like, it was amazing. Now it's all blown out. There's no waves. Oh, and, or, or you're a skier, and you get up, you know, drive up to ski, and you get there, and they go, and, and, and it's just terrible weather, and they go, oh, man, yesterday, 
It was a foot of, you know, of fresh powder. It was blue skies. You should have been here yesterday. Or if you invest money, if you're an investor, oh, you should have invested yesterday. Oh, it was right. You know, those moments where you get in right after something really cool has happened, you're like, oh, you're disappointed. That's what happened to Thomas. They're gathered. He's not there. Jesus shows up. That's better than good waves, good snow, or a good investment. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, shows up, and he missed it. So turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm going to begin in verse 19. And what we're going to pick up is, is John's telling the same story that we studied last week in the Gospel of Luke. This is the first time Jesus shows up. I want you to notice what Jesus says to the disciples. Here's what I want you to notice. Notice what Thomas missed. They're all gathered. He's not there. Notice what happens, and just think about what are some of the things that Thomas missed? Because when Thomas showed up after Jesus was gone again, and they're telling him, they're telling him all this stuff, and he's going, oh, I missed that, I missed that, I missed that. You know, okay, so, so look with me at, at John chapter 20, beginning verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, they were afraid that the people who had killed Jesus wanted to kill them. Of course they were worried about that. They were his followers, right? So they're in a room, the door's locked, right? Jesus came and stood among them. Boom, he's there. The resurrected Jesus. Jesus, before he was resurrected, never did that. Now he does. He just shows up. And he says, peace be with you. I love those words. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands, the nail prints, his side, where the spear had been thrust. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They got it. They got to experience Jesus. Thomas missed it all. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. A second time, he bestows peace on them. And then he says this, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. He gives them a mission. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, a special presence of God's Spirit on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. There's a lot going on in this passage. Here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice what happened as Jesus met the disciples this first time after the resurrection and what Thomas missed, all right? Because when, when they saw him, they, they told him the story in detail. And Thomas said, I missed that, I missed that, I missed that. So first, Jesus reassures them. I'm risen, I'm here. They all got that face to face with the risen Jesus. Who didn't get it? Thomas, right? Jesus offers them shalom. Twice, he says, peace be with you. They were wound up. I mean, they're in the door. The doors are locked because they're afraid, right? They've seen their savior, the one they've been following, crucified. And he comes and says, it's okay. Peace be with you. And then a little bit later, they, he says again, peace be with you. So Jesus is bringing, they got to experience that peace from Jesus. Guess who didn't get to experience that peace? Who? Thomas. Missed it. Should have been. Should have been here. It was awesome. You missed it by two hours. You know, but he missed it, right? And then, Jesus sends them on mission. He says, I want you to go on mission. I want you to keep sharing my love and sharing my grace with others. They receive that call from Jesus. But Thomas missed it. Of course he's disappointed. Of course he's struggling. How about this one? What does Jesus do? He breathes on them the presence of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Here's the Spirit. So they're going to Thomas. Then Thomas, Thomas. Then, then Jesus breathed on us and his Holy Spirit came on us in power. And Thomas is like, I missed that too? I mean, it's like, it, they, they just keep kind of telling, they're, they're telling, and then Jesus calls them to extend his grace. If you forgive others, they're forgiven, and they're filled with joy. So Jesus says, you bear my forgiveness, but Thomas didn't get that either. So here's Thomas, and he, he, he loves Jesus. You know, we can look at Thomas, and we can say, oh, Thomas, he's doubting Thomas, but remember this, earlier on in the Gospel of John, when Jesus says, I'm going to go to the city of Bethany, when there, was, there were people looking to basically have him killed, things were getting pretty intense, and, and, and the, the disciples said, we can't, go, we can't go to Bethany because it's dangerous there. One of the disciples said this, let's go with Jesus to Bethany. Let's go with him even if we have to die with him. You know which, you know which disciple said that? Let's go with him even if we have to die with him. You know who said that? Thomas. He had moments of great faith, but right now he's in a moment of struggling. Does that sound like anybody you know who's a Christian? Like the person you look at in the mirror every day? <laughs> moments of great faith and moments of, man, I'm really struggling. And, and, and so, so now, now Thomas hears about all these things that he missed. 
And a whole week's gonna go by, day after day after day after day, and he doesn't see Jesus, and he's struggling, right? Now shift back over to the story of my sister Allie. For years and years, us four siblings would say, Allie, we've met Jesus. He's alive. He loves us. And she'd keep Jesus at arm's length, but I haven't met him. I haven't experienced that. She wasn't there yet. Allie, he's changing our lives. Would you open your heart to Jesus? Interested, curious, but not ready to receive Jesus. Maybe that's some of you today. You're like, I like church. I have lots of friends. I respect them that are Christians, and, and I'm open to Jesus, but I just, there's something keeping, and just kind of keeping them at arm's length. After years, uh, two of my sisters, uh, Gretchen and, and Lisa, both started going to the same church down in Orange County, and Allie still lived in Orange County. So Gretchen and Lisa were going to Mariner's Church down in, in Irvine. And they said, Allie, you should come to church with us. The, mu- the music's great. And Allie, all, all our whole family had, grew up in a kind of a musical family, so she loved music. So she started coming to church with them. She really liked it. They had a choir in the church. So my sister Allison said, I wonder if they'd let me be in the choir. Now remember, she's not a Christian yet. She, she's coming to church. She's checking out Jesus like some of you are, but she's keeping Jesus at arm's length. So she went to the choir leader and said, I'm not a Christian yet, but could I be part of the choir? And I love that that choir director said, we'd love to have you be part of the choir. And invited her in. And that choir surrounded my sister for like the next year and a half and just loved her and let let her be part of their family, part of their community, while she still not yet embraced Jesus. But they invited her in. And what a a beautiful picture. But but again, her doubts were keeping her away. And I I remember a couple times saying, Allie, you know, is your, is your heart open to Jesus? Are you ready to receive Jesus? One time she said to me, oh, I don't think it's a matter of if I'm gonna become a Christian. It's a matter of when. So I said, how about now? And she said, not quite ready yet. <laughs> but we had those honest conversations, right? Just, just, just talking about life, talking about faith. And, and so, so along the journey, before you know Jesus and after you know Jesus, there's times where there's struggle and there's times where there's doubts. And so here's what I want to invite you to do. First, to open your eyes and see the risen Jesus. Kind of look at this biblical passage and see Jesus. And we're going to look at the next passage where where a week has gone by, the disciples are gathered, and this time Thomas is with them. And take a wild guess who shows up. I'm not going to tell you. I'll read it in just a minute, but I think you got it figured out. Okay? Uh, He loves to meet us right where we are. So we're going to look at the text. We're going to look at John chapter 20, beginning at verse 24. And, and here in verse 24, I want you just to follow along with what's going on. So, so we read the earlier passage from John where Jesus showed up, all this stuff happens, and Thomas isn't there, okay? So we'll pick it up at verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. It was just great for them, but Thomas hadn't experienced that, right? So then we continue on. But he, Thomas, said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, like you got to, right? Unless I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. He says, I didn't see what you saw. I didn't experience what you experienced. I'm not ready to believe yet. But that's where I love how patient Jesus is, how much he loves us, right? It's a pretty natural response. But then we continue on, verse 26. So now a week has gone by. Thomas still hasn't encountered Jesus. He's still hearing these stories from everyone else, but he didn't get to to experience it, right? So pick it up with me at verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, they're still nervous, they're still afraid that they could get attacked too, that the people who had killed Jesus might be looking for them. So the doors are locked, and Jesus again came and stood among them. Boom, he's there. Didn't knock on the door, just he's there. Boom, right? Peace be with you, he says. Then, now watch what happens. He doesn't talk to all of them at this moment. Jesus appears. Who does he look at? Who does he talk to? Is he yelling and angry? No. He wants Thomas to believe and step back toward him again, just like he wants each of us to do, right? So then he said to Thomas in verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? He holds out his nail-pierced hand. He says, Thomas, put your finger right there. If you have, that's what it takes, Thomas. Here's my hand. And then he says, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Thomas, if you have to touch my, my cut up body and put your hand on my side to see that I'm the risen one, then please do. And then Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. What a picture. 
Jesus does that for us. He says, if you, need, if you need to touch my hand, if you need to touch my side, if you're still searching for Jesus and trying to figure out if he loves you, ask him. Say, Jesus, come near to me. Show yourself to me. He'll be amazed. He's ready to draw near and to show himself to you. And then verse 28, here's the response of Thomas. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. The, the indication of the text is that he didn't have to walk over and actually touch Jesus' hands or touch his side. Jesus said, if you need to do this, feel free. If that, Thomas, if that's what it takes to, to restore your faith and draw you near to me, you can do that. But I, I think that the way it reads is that once Jesus said that and he's there, Thomas just goes, my Lord, my God. You're my Lord. You're the boss. You're in charge. You're the, you're the big kahuna, the big cheese, whatever term you want to use. You are the Lord. Lord means you're in charge. He says, my whole life is yours. And you are my God. I believe you are God who came and died on the cross and paid the price and rose again. You are my Savior and you are the leader of my life. Thomas declares it. What a beautiful, powerful picture. So a question for us. Can you see Jesus then and now? Can you see Jesus with Thomas, with the disciples? The same Jesus today. Jesus who says, I'm not offended by your questions. I don't get angry about your doubt. I'll just draw near to you and say, hey, reach out and touch me. Jesus says, I'm here. Can you see that Jesus then, the way he reached out to Peter, is reaching out to you? If you're a Christian and you're struggling with doubts, say, Jesus, restore deep in my faith as I grapple with my doubts. If you're not yet a Christian, could you say, Jesus, I, I, there's ways. I, I need you to show your face to me. Speak to my heart. Do, you know, just say, God, reveal yourself to me. Open your heart to that. He wants to. He's willing to. He'll meet you where you're at. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then we open our ears. Open your ears to hear the risen Jesus, to hear what he said then, because what he said then is still true today. His words echo through history into our hearts and into our minds. Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to the things he said to his followers then, because if you're a Christian, he's saying them to you now. And if you're not a Christian and you become a Christian, he will speak these words to you. Jesus hears and knows our doubts, and he still loves us. Can you hear Jesus just saying, Show, share your problems? Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said, I won't believe unless I see his hands and touch his side. But Jesus was there, because it's the risen Jesus, and he was everywhere. And your doubts and your questions, he knows them. He does. Can I tell you, if you're a Christian and you struggle with doubts, don't, when, when you're struggling, you say, I believe, I have faith, but I'm also doubting. In your doubts, don't step away from Jesus. In your doubt, step toward him. And that's, that's when you need him to take you in his arms and to guide you through. And if you're not yet a Christian, I, I would challenge you, in those times of doubt, bring those to Jesus because he cares. The truth we embrace how about this, that Jesus still shows up wherever we are. Jesus showed up in the garden for the women, on the road for, the two, for, for Cleophas and the other disciple. He shows up in locked rooms. He shows up where you are. He's ready. You, you, it's nice to be at church. I love church. But you don't have to be in some specially sacred place to meet with God. He's looking for you wherever you are, wherever you are today. His eyes are upon you, and he can meet you right there. So just know that he is searching and seeking to come near you. He still shows up. Jesus speaks peace to you in your times of struggle. Peace be with you. When you're alarmed, when you're doubting, when you're struggling, Jesus comes and says, peace be with you. And we need to hear that. If you're a Christian, you should hear that today. Jesus says, peace be with you. If you're not a Christian, he's ready to offer that peace to you, a peace that goes beyond your comprehension or understanding. Jesus is ready to reassure you. He came along the, alongside the disciples in their struggles, in their fears, and he reassured them. And if you need that reassurance, you can say to Jesus, would you just reaffirm and reassure, I want to just draw near to you in a fresh new way. Jesus still sends us. Just like with the disciples, he said, I'm going to send you. I believe that every follower of Jesus has a mission. Wherever you go, your workplace, your school, your neighborhood, wherever you go, you go with Jesus in your heart and in your life, and you go on mission. So you bring his love, and you show his peace, and you show his, he said, he said the people who you forgive, I'm gonna forgive. He said, I want you to be a bearer of my grace and my forgiveness. Bring his message. Go on his mission every day of your life. And Jesus still empowers us. Just like he breathed the Holy Spirit on them, he says, when you become a Christian, I bring the Spirit to live in you and the Spirit will never leave you and the power of the resurrection resides in your life. Did you know that? If you're a Christian, every moment you walk through this life, if you are a Christian, the Spirit of the living God lives in you. And you have more power than you can imagine or dream in the power of the Holy Spirit. So walk in that power and live in that power. 
So can you hear and accept the words of Jesus? Can you say, I'm forgiven and I bear his forgiveness? I've received his peace and I share his peace. He comes near me. He's not afraid of my doubts. He doesn't get mad at me. He understands me and he wants to lead me forward. Can you walk in that and believe that and receive that if you're a Christian? And if you become a Christian, can you embrace that and walk in that and live in that? And then, so we understand and we hear, but now we need to act. Open your life to follow the risen Jesus. Will you say, if you are a Christian or if you're open and you become a Christian at some point, will you say, I'm gonna walk on Jesus' path. This is what I call the trail we walk. We walk a trail, we walk a path, hand in hand with Jesus, with him leading the way. Will you walk your life hand in hand with Jesus, letting him be in charge? Our life should not be like this. Okay, Jesus, I'm going here. Come on, come on. Jesus, come on. And Jesus, you're like, he's trying to put, no, get over here, Jesus. It's like, no, no, it's, it's Jesus, you lead me. You show me where to go. Much better way to live, by the way. Because when we take the hand of Jesus and we go somewhere really stupid or dangerous or inappropriate, he doesn't let go of our hand. He says, okay, if you're going there, I'm going with you. And we're like, I don't want to know you're here, Jesus, but, but he's there. Walk hand in hand with Jesus, but let him lead you. So what is the trail we walk? Just some questions for you. And if you're a follower of Jesus or if you eventually become a follower of Jesus, these are good questions to ask yourself, okay? You say, I'm walking with Jesus in this world. I, I believe he's risen, he's with me. Here's some good questions to ask. Will you live in the shalom of Jesus? Will you live every day trying to walk in the peace of Jesus? That means when you walk into a room, people go, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Because when you come in the room, peace comes with you. They may not even know why. They just know when you come, peace comes with you and people want to be around that. Will you walk in the peace of Jesus? Will you embrace the mission of Jesus? Will you say every day, Jesus, I'm in. Wherever I go today, whatever I do, business meetings, social studying, hanging out with friends in the neighborhood, at my middle school, at my high school, at, on my college campus, Jesus, I'm going with you. And I'll keep my eyes and heart open to anything you want me to do. I'm on mission with you every day. Will you accept the power of Jesus? Will you recognize that you can live and walk every day with all the power you need to live the way God wants you to live? He's given that to you already if you've come to the cross and received Jesus. Will you declare the person and divinity of Jesus? How did Thomas respond when he finally recognized who Jesus was? He says, you are my God. You are divine. King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of the universe. As a Christian, will you say, Jesus, you are my God and I worship you. And then, will you surrender to the lordship of Jesus? You are my Lord and my God. I worship you as God, I follow you as leader in all that I do. That's the kind of life a Christian's invited to. Thomas discovered it. The disciples got to be in that room with Thomas looking over his shoulder, listening to Jesus talk to Thomas, but they're all, they're all taking notes, right? They're all learning of what it means to walk with Jesus, to walk with the resurrected Jesus. So here Thomas is, he's struggling, he's doubting. Jesus shows up, my Lord and my God. And he reaches out to Jesus. You know, Jesus doesn't scold him, Jesus just invites him in. That's what he does with us too. My sister Allie, after decades of watching her siblings walk with Jesus, watching her little brother who was just a huge troublemaker become a pastor. How's that work, right? After, after watching, after watching her, her family, she's still kind of keeping Jesus at arm's length. And, and then, and then, after being part of a church for a year and a half, singing in the choir, being loved by all these people, but still not quite there, having other family members say, Allie, are you ready to receive Jesus? Not there yet. Probably eventually, but not quite yet. Holding off. I flew out from Michigan we were living in Michigan at the time, and we were getting a family time together. It was actually, uh, I tell people, the only thing our family did religiously is we went to Don Jose's on Sunday for Mexican food. Every Sunday, it was like a family thing. That, that, was, our, that was the only thing we did as a reg It wasn't like religion, but it was kind of for our family. So as a matter of fact, this next Saturday, I'll be down in Orange County with my, all of my siblings who are now in North Carolina, Colorado, Washington State, Southern California, and here. We're gonna all be together for two days. We had a loss in our family. We're just gonna be together with our extended family to kind of just think together about the loss of one of my cousins. And um, so we're all gonna be together and we're gonna to go to Don Jose's because that's where our family goes, right? Not the best Mexican food in the world, but there's memories there, right? And so I drove over there with just Allie and I in the car driving over to go with the family at Don Jose's. This is years ago. 
And as we're in the car driving, I just said to her, Allie, where are you at with Jesus? Where are you at? And she said, I think like she said before, I, I, I think I'm gonna become a Christian eventually. I'm just not ready yet. So I asked a question. And if you were there, you would have probably asked the same question. I just said, well, Allie, why not? What's in the way? What's keeping you from, from embracing Jesus? And here's what she said. She said, I'm afraid. I wouldn't have guessed that. But she said, I'm afraid. So then I asked her a question. Now, you don't have to be a genius. What do you think the next question I asked her? She said, I'm afraid. What do you think I asked her? What are you afraid of? Afraid of what, right? I mean, it's not complicated to have a spiritual conversation. I just said, what are you afraid of? And all three things that she said amazed me. First, she said, she said, totally seriously, she said, I know when you asked Jesus to forgive you, he forgave you for your sins. I know when, when, Gretchen, when Gretchen, and she said, I, and I know because know I'm going to church now that anybody asked to be forgiven, I know that Jesus forgives them. And here's what she said. I'm afraid I'm going to be the first person that God says no to. And I said, Allie, that's just a lie. See, Satan was whispering these lies in her ear to keep her away from Jesus. I said, Jesus is waiting with his arms open. He loves you. He died for you. She said, I know, but I just am afraid. She said, I'm afraid he's going to tell, tell me no. I said, Allie, he won't. He won't. And we just talked about it. And she kind of resolved that in her heart. And I said, is there anything else you're afraid of? And she said, I'm afraid if I become a Christian that I'm going to still mess up and do things that are wrong. And I said, well, let me help you with that one. <laughs> I said, you will. You'll try to follow him, but, but in his arms, but I said, you'll struggle. I said, Ali, I've been a Christian for like three decades at the time. I said, I've been a Christian for a long time. I'm a pastor. I said, I still struggle. I said, the difference, and she's got two boys, she, uh, Travis and Justin. I said, you know, when Travis and Justin were little and when they'd fall down walking or fall off a bike, would you guys like, what's wrong with you? Or would you run and pick them up? She said, well, I'd pick them up. I said, that's what he does with you and me. When you fall, he picks you up. So I said, I said, I said you shouldn't not become a Christian because you're afraid you're going to struggle and fail because we will fail. You don't, you don't keep sinning because God forgives, but you do your best not to sin. But when you do, his grace is enough. And we talked about grace. I said, is there anything else you're afraid of? And she said, yeah. She said, I'm afraid of what God might ask me to do. She'd watched three of her siblings go into ministry. She couldn't imagine becoming a Christian, Christian much less like, what if, God, what if God called me to, you know, she, she was afraid of what God might call her to. You know what I said to her? I said, I said, you should be afraid of that. <laughs> I said, because you understand to give your heart to Jesus is to give your whole life. She says, yeah. She, she took it seriously, right? But we talked about that. I said, if God calls you to something over time, he'll equip you for it, he'll prepare you. We talked about that. And then I said, is there anything else you're afraid of? She said, no. And I said, are you ready today to receive? We're sitting in her car outside of Don Jose's. I said, are you ready today to receive Jesus? And my sister, who I love, said, yes. And we prayed together. And my sister, who has been my sister by blood for my whole life, became my sister through faith in the sacrifice of Jesus for eternal life. It, she kept Jesus away for years for fears that weren't even real fears. And when she finally let her arm in and stepped into his arms, he wrapped his arms around her. And she became part of God's family. And you'll meet her, if you're a Christian, you will meet her someday. Maybe here at Shoreline Church if she comes to visit, but if not, you will meet her in glory. Because she's part of God's family. Because she gave her heart to Jesus. See, as Thomas walked through his life, and Jesus said, let's, let's go to Bethany. Let's go take care of Lazarus. And the disciples are, we're afraid. Thomas says, let's go with him that we may die with him, even if we die with him. Bull Thomas. And then Thomas who says, I won't believe unless I get to touch his hands and touch his feet and touch his side. Thomas had deep faith and he also had real fears. And so do you and so do I. And my sister Allison, singing in the church choir. Uh, and when I got to go down to Mariner's Church and baptize my sister in the fountain at Mariner's Church, the whole choir circled the fountain and saying for their new sister in Christ who had been part of their choir for a year and a half, but now had become part of their family of God because she was willing to kind of, and you know what? There's still questions and fears that she had, but it was enough to say, I'm ready to walk into the arms of Jesus. And so Jesus, today, we come before you. And really, Jesus, as you see the world, you see only two kinds of people who are online right now and two kinds of people who are on campus right now. You see those who have 
put their faith in you, even with their doubts and struggles, they have said, I believe in Jesus. They have said, my Lord and my God, my Savior and the one who will lead me. And for all of us who have made that commitment, I pray that this day, We will go deeper in faith and love you more. And even in our moments of doubt, we will not pull away from you, Jesus, but we'll run to your arms because that's the best place to be when we're struggling and hurting. And if that's you, if you're a follower of Jesus, will you just say, Jesus, grow my faith and lead me closer and closer to your heart in my moments of doubt. And make that your prayer. And if you're online today, or if you're on campus, and you are not yet a follower of Jesus, You may have gone to church for years. You may have thought a lot about Jesus, but you know you've always kept him a little bit at arm's length and you've never said, Jesus, I surrender to you. I'm gonna invite you to pray right now with me. If you wanna receive Jesus Christ as as the leader of your life, your Lord, and as your Savior, the one who washes away your sins. Because he who died on the cross and paid for our sins offers you his forgiveness and offers you his grace. So if you say today, I'm ready to receive Jesus, whether you're online or on campus, will you pray this prayer in your heart with absolute boldness to Jesus who is leaning into you with his arms open, listening for this prayer? Will you tell him, dear Jesus, I don't have it all figured out and I don't have all the answers, but I open my heart to you this day. I step into your arms I receive your forgiveness that washes away all of my sins and all of my wrongs. I confess my wrongs. I confess my sins where I have messed up. I confess the things I can't even remember anymore. I give them all to you. And I accept your payment on the cross when you gave your life as the payment for my sins so that they are now washed away. And I take your hand right now, Jesus, And I will follow you the best I can all the days of my life. When I stumble, pick me back up again. And when I follow you faithfully, let me feel your joy. Jesus, I declare like Thomas did that you are my Lord and my God. And just in the quietness of this moment, if you prayed that prayer today, And if you're online and you prayed that prayer, right now, will you do one thing? And it may seem a little strange, but will you just pick up your phone and text the word faith, F-A-I-T-H, to the number you see on your screen. Text that one word. And do it right now, because the enemy's gonna try to take this away from you. Don't let him. And when you text that one word, what we wanna do is we wanna get a hold of you to give you a Bible and to see how we can help you take some next steps of your growth as you walk with Jesus on this wonderful journey of walking in his peace and his forgiveness and his power. So just text the word faith right now to that number and we'll follow up with you within the next 24 hours. We will reach out to you and we will make sure that any way we can help you, we are here. Wherever you are, maybe you say, well, but I'm I'm in a different country, I'm in a different continent. Please respond and let us reach out to you because we wanna walk with you wherever you are. And if you're on campus, if you're in the family worship venue or if if you're in the courtyard, and there's a good group out in the courtyard today, and you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus today, will you look right over at the pergola right there and Heather's gonna be there. Go right over to Heather right when I close this time and I send you off with a blessing. Go right over to her and just say, I prayed that prayer with Pastor Kevin. And she wants to give you a Bible and just take the next step to say, how can we help you grow in Jesus? If you're in the worship center today or if you're anywhere on campus and you wanna talk to Sherry and my wife Sherry and I are gonna be right up front right here in just a moment. And if right when, when I send you off with a blessing, just come right up front and just say, I prayed that prayer. And we want to give you a Bible and we want to pray with you and just rejoice with you that you've given your heart to Jesus and you're starting a whole new journey. Dear Jesus, thank you for this chance to be together today. Thank you for those of us who've known you for a season of time, a short time or a long time. Help us walk in your power, in your resurrection power every moment of every day. And for those who prayed today for the first time to receive Jesus, Lord, let them have the courage to reach out through a text or through face-to-face contact right now and just say, what do I do next? And let us walk with them and help them along. And Lord, I want to pray for those who might say, I'm a step closer, but I'm still an arm's length from Jesus. I'm not ready yet. Lord, may they know that they're absolutely loved and welcomed at Shoreline Church. Jesus, that your arms are open, our arms are open. As they try to figure out who you are, Jesus, let them just walk with us and know that they are part of this community of people and loved and welcomed as they're trying to figure out who you are, Jesus. We pray this in your name, risen and loving Jesus. And everyone said...
Amen. Before I have you stand and send you off with a word of blessing, uh, I want to give a couple of invitations. If you want prayer for anything in your life, a joy or a need, if you're online, just call the number you see online or send your prayer needs to the email address and we will be praying for you. If you're on campus, there's teams up front here on both sides. They're ready to pray with you. So come right up front here in the worship center and join us for prayer here. If you're new at Shoreline and you're in the worship center or on campus, just go right to the Connection Center right in the lobby there. They want to give you a little gift bag. They have a gift bag for you and they want to welcome you personally. If you're online, just text the word welcome. To the, to the number you see right there, and we will reach out and welcome you as personally as we can in that manner. So we want to reach out to you and welcome you there personally. And also, because it's Mother's Day, you'll notice maybe coming in that we've got outdoors and inside some spaces for pictures with balloon, balloons and sparkly stuff and fun things. If you're here with family and you want a picture, we have people at each of those places to take pictures. Just go up to them, hand them your phone. They will take family pictures, whatever you want, and you can have that to take with you. So that, just enjoy that and have a lot of fun with that. If you're able to stand wherever you are, online or on campus, will you stand with me and just give me the honor of sending you off with a word of blessing. As you go from this time together, go with confidence that Jesus understands our doubts. Whether we're coming to him for the first time or walking with him, he understands our doubts and he still loves us. So when you doubt, run toward him, not away from him. And if you don't yet know him, his arms are always open. He's always ready as soon as you are to just drop your block, step into his arms, and he will change you forever. Go from this place in his peace, on his mission, bringing his grace. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We pray.